Welcome to the third day of the Probabilistic AI Summer School. Uh, today, today is the Deep Generative Model Day, uh, and uh, I'm glad to uh, introduce you guys to Rianne van der Berg. Uh, she did a PhD in condensed matter physics at the uh, University of Amsterdam, and then postdoctoral work there in the Amsterdam uh, Machine Learning Lab. She's been doing uh, a lot of work in deep generative model, variational inference, um, uh, different like uh, novel architectures that we'll learn today, like diffusion models and uh, equivariant flows and all of related things to that. Uh, and also in her team, we have uh, Victor Garcia Soter, uh, Satoras, uh, who also did his PhD in Amsterdam, and also uh, Chin Wei Huang, who did his PhD at uh, Mila in Montreal. And all of them are part of the team in Microsoft Research in Amsterdam. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Um, maybe first good morning, second, can you all hear me properly? Yeah, okay, nobody's screaming now. Okay, good. Um, right, so thank you for, uh, for having me, very nice. Um, so this entire day will be about deep generative models. Um, and I'll briefly introduce where I work and then tell you what the program for today will be, okay? So uh, my name is Rianne, as uh, and was already said, uh, I work at AI for Science at uh, Microsoft Research. Um, in Amsterdam. Um, let me see if this works. Yes, so AI for Science is a new team that is part of Microsoft Research, was funded a, a bit more than a year ago, where as the name kind of suggests, we do machine learning for the natural sciences. Uh, so this is on the intersection of physics, chemistry, biology, and machine learning. Um, and we have quite a global team. So we are in Amsterdam, where the team that is going to be presented to you today works. Uh, but we also have people in uh, Shanghai, in Beijing, Berlin is the newest edition, uh, Redmond and Cambridge in the UK, where actually uh, Microsoft Research was the biggest in Europe before. Um, and as was already said, today's lecture team is not just me, but in the afternoon you will be uh, uh, given a workshop by Chinwei Huang and uh, Victor Casillas Sartoras. Uh, they are both my colleagues at, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, they have a lot of experience also in generative modeling, and they'll uh, give you a more hands-on workshop. And this morning, we'll only do lectures. So in the morning, we'll start. It's three hours of lectures. I promise I won't do it three hours nonstop. I think, don't think that's good for you nor me. Um, we'll start with 45 minutes of variational autoencoders. Then we'll take a 15 minutes break, if that's okay with you guys, just to uh, you know, get our energies up a bit. Uh, then we'll do about 45 minutes of normalizing flows, and then we'll do about, uh, we'll have a 15 minutes break again, and then we'll do about an hour, including questions, on uh, denoising diffusion models. Okay? Um, right. Now, um, in the afternoon, as I said, it will be more hands-on, so Chinwei and Victor, Chinwei is already sitting here, Victor is probably, you know, they worked very hard last night in getting the exercise done, so... Uh, Victor is probably still recovering from that. Um, so they'll give you, say, a, a hands-on workshop on making a diffusion model for molecule generation. And this is based on a paper that uh, Victor worked on in his previous job, so not at Microsoft, uh, at the University of Amsterdam, um, this paper over here. So I think that'll be very exciting. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions or remarks, I'd like to hear it. Yeah. Not yet, but we can make them available. All right, um, okay, so in the morning, as I said, we'll start with variational autoencoders. I'll try to keep it at 45 minutes. Uh, I'll do my best, we'll just stop at 45, and then uh, we'll have a break, okay? Um, now, it's always a little bit difficult when you give these lectures because there's probably people with a lot of knowledge on generative models, there's people with maybe less knowledge on generative models, so you'll have to help me a little bit in telling me when I go too fast or not. So let's hopefully agree that if, I, if there's something you don't understand, please raise your hand, and if I'm so focused that I don't see your hand, just shout, right? Then I can actually see that you have a question, and then we'll try to make it a bit more interactive, because otherwise it'll be, I don't want to be lecturing for 45 minutes and you all going like, I have no idea what she's talking about. Um, yeah, so if you help me a little bit, then uh, I think it'll be, a, we'll try to make it work, okay? All right, so variational autoencoders. Before I start with variational autoencoders, We'll start with autoencoders, which are not variational, 
but uh, just to get a, a good introduction to that. So what are autoencoders? In autoencoders, we have a neural network, which takes as input a data point, and the data point will start to denote with, these, with this vector x, which has, you know, in this example, five dimensions. And as a next, say, concrete example, this could be an image, which of course has more dimensions than just five typically, but let's say. Now, this autoencoder takes this image as an input, pushes it through a neural network that typically has a bottleneck that is smaller than the dimension of the input size, right? And then pushes it to its output, and the outputs are typically of the same dimension as the input. And then what it tries to do is to make sure that the output is as close as possible to the input, right? So we have a, a, a reconstruction loss. Now, that sounds a bit silly, but what is useful for these networks is the bottleneck layer that is typically smaller dimensions, which we sometimes call the code. And this code should be, say, a compressed representation of your data. So with that, you can do other downstream tasks such as uh, uh, classification, or you can use it perhaps for reinforcement learning, any other downstream tasks that for which it's better that we get a lower dimensional representation of the original data. Okay? All right. Now, autoencoders, as I explained them before, aren't really generative models, right? And we're here to talk about generative models. Uh, but how do you turn them into generative models? Well, one way of doing that is to say, well, this code, which we denoted with the symbol Z, we can put a distribution on them, right? So we can put, in this case, a prior distribution on it. So that means that given an input X, I have multiple options of uh, uh, Z, right? I have a whole distribution over Z. Now, if I have that, so if I put a distribution on this code, I have created a latent variable, right, another random variable, um, and I can put a distribution on that. And if I have that, I can actually start sampling from it, right? If I want to sample at this from test time, I take this prior distribution that I defined, this P of Z. You can see my markings, right? Yeah. Um, I sample a vector from it, and I push it through the second half of the neural network, right? So I leave the first half alone, the encoder, and I just push it through the second half, and then I've actually sampled new the outputs of that network will give me new data points, right? If the neural network was trained properly, right? An untrained neural network is going to give you bogus, but let's say that you trained your autoencoder, this is going to work. All right. Questions on this so far? Is, no? Yeah. Which other latent space? Ah, so how? So in the first latent space, so in this slide, let me put it this way. Here, I hadn't actually defined the distribution over this code, right? Here, I just take x as an input, a data point, and for every x, there's only one code, right? So I don't know what to sample from in that case. So there, we haven't defined. I mean, I can call the distribution it's a delta distribution, right? That doesn't really work. So what you could do is, say, train an autoencoder like that with no distribution on it, and then, say, at test time, I take my input, and for every input, I compute its one code, and I train a probabilistic model on that, that I could do, but then I essentially do what I was telling you in the next slides, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So, if we put a distribution on a latent space, we have a generative autoencoder. All right. Okay, now a variational autoencoder is a particular type of a generative autoencoder, and it works as follows. So just taking a step back, what we want to do with a generative model, right, is we have a data distribution, which we don't know, right? We only have a particular set of samples from it, and we want to train a model that has learnable parameters. We'll, we'll call those learnable parameters theta here. And we want to take a generative probabilistic model that we optimize to be as close as possible to the true data distribution that we don't know, okay? Okay, now what we're going to try to do to make this data, to make this model distribution very flexible, we're going to take a model that is a latent variable model. So we're gonna take a model that takes the data, x, but also has another random variable, this code that we talked about before, this latent variable, right? And this is latent in the sense that you never actually observe this, you have to learn it. So that means that we have a model distribution that is essentially a latent variable model, which we will 
decompose like this. We'll take a prior distribution over this latent variable, Z, and we'll take a conditional distribution that if you would give me a value of that Z, I can produce a new data point, X. Okay, so the graphical model looks like that. So what we have now in terms of neural network architecture is only the decoder part of what we previously called an autoencoder. Right, we had Z, this prior distribution, that lives here, let's say it's a standard Gaussian, right? That could produce you these Zs. And now I have a set of, I have this decoder that is essentially this, that parameterizes this distribution that can give me new data points, right? So I don't have an autoencoder at all yet, I just have a decoder and a probabilistic model on top of it. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay, all right. So graphical model looks like this, right? So we have this latent Z, where here the dashed line means, around the box, means that it's latent, right? We've never observed it. And that, if you know Z, through the conditional distribution P of X given Z, I get X, okay? All right, now we want to optimize this model, right? We want to do generative model and get it close to the data distribution. So what we would like to optimize is the, what we'd like to maximize is the logarithm of the marginal P of theta X, right? And we want to do that, of course, while drawing samples X from the true distribution, right? We have a set of data points for that. Okay, now we could do that. We can plug in the, the definition that we have at the top, right, of the, of the latent variable model. And then we get something like this, right? So we get the logarithm of the expectation, right, which is the integral, right, over this uh, conditional. Now, I, I, again, as I said, it's hard to know when I go too fast or too slow. Is everyone okay with that equation? Or if people are not, can you tell me? Yes, okay. So what I want to plug in, mm, let me do this. What I have to plug inside here, right, is P of theta, X, right? And this is, if I use uh, the definition here up top, right? I've only actually defined the joint of P of X and Z, right? Now, if I use just probabilist standard probabilistic rules, right? I can write that as D of Z, P Z, P X comma Z, right? And this is equivalent to writing it as this expectation, yeah? All right. Now, I could try to optimize this, but does anybody know why this is problematic? Any hint? Or maybe, maybe you can try to, if, if you don't know why it's problematic, maybe you can try to tell me how you would optimize it if I would give you this as an exercise. Maybe then we can walk into the problems that we have. I will give you one data point, X, and I would ask you to evaluate the right-hand side of that equation. Anybody? Go ahead. So we would need to integrate our set, right? So yeah. this can be quite complex, like, depending on how we define the of set, might be expected to do. Yeah, okay, so the answer is just, let me repeat it in case it's not audible in the, it, uh, at the back, is that in order to evaluate this for a single x, we have to integrate over z, right? And this integral for, if we have a very, if, if we deviate only a little bit from the most simple thing for P of Z and P of X comma Z, this integral, we can't do that analytically, right? So that means we'd have to numerically integrate it. And that can get very expensive. Now, we could do many different things for the numerical integration. We could do, I don't know, some quadrature grid or something to be very precise. We could also say, let me do an MC, MC estimate, right? Does anybody know why that would be problematic? Right, so an MCMC estimate is where you draw a finite number of samples, in this case, from P of Z, and just sum up the contributions of P of, of, P of X comma Z. Right, so it's just a sum. I draw, let's say, K samples from P of Z. So I, I draw K Z. I evaluate P of X comma Z for those K samples and sum them up and divide them over the number of samples. That's it. And then I apply the logarithm. Okay, so the suggestion is that this might be very expensive to do the forward pass. That is true, but in the end, whatever we're going to do, we'll have to do that. So unfortunately, we can't circumvent that. 
sampling in high dimensional spaces is very inefficient. Also true. Unfortunately, we will still have to do that. So we cannot circum we will be sampling. What I said, we will be doing it, but not exactly like this. Also true. Yes. So log of sum is not the sum of the logs. Also true. Now, perhaps I can give a hint because it's very close to that. If I want to do an MCMC -MC estimate, right, of an integral, I want that to be, in the limit of infinite samples, I want that to be equal to the integral, right? Otherwise, why would I do it, right? And I want it to be not, if I have a finite number of samples, I want it to be on average, give me the correct answer, right? I don't want to be a shift or something in the, in the number. But if I do an MCMC -MC estimate inside a logarithm, I don't, no longer have the guarantee. So the general rule is if you, want to do, if you want to approximate an integral with an MCMC -MC estimate, you shouldn't then go ahead and apply another function outside of it because then you no longer have that property, right? Um, so what we can't do, even if, that's maybe, if that gets too vague right now, what you shouldn't do is do MCMC -MC inside a function, right? We can do MCMC -MC outside of a function, that's fine, but not in. Unless the function has special properties, that's fine. But in this case, the logarithm, right? It's not a linear. It's not a linear function. It kind of tails off, and you don't get the correct answer on average. Okay, so we're not going to do that, but we will sample, <laughs> and also in high dimensions. Okay, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to do optimize this surrogate objective, which is a lower bound to the original objective, right? So we wanted to do this. We wanted to maximize this with respect to theta, but instead we're going to do op oh. That's not correct. We're going to optimize this thing, which we'll call the evidence lower bound. And let's quickly unpack what that all means. Now, I've introduced a new distribution, Q of Z given X, right? We didn't have that, but this will be, at some point, in three slides, an encoder distribution. For now, it is a distribution that models the latent variable conditioned on the real data X. Okay, I've reintroduced that. Now, if you look at these two terms, you can see that this looks a little bit like a reconstruction term, the first term, right? So what I do here is you give me a data point X, I, and I, I give in that X, I put it through this Q, this inference distribution, that infers a latent variable from it, right? And the inference here means that you, know, you infer something that you didn't know before. So I now sample a latent variable, Z, given that X, and I plug in that Z into this decoder neural network that is also shown here on the top right. And given that Z, I get another X, right? right? I check to what, what, what the probability is, given that Z, that this was the correct X, right? So this is a pure reconstruction loss that we also saw on the first slide for uh, the autoencoder, right? I take X, I sample Z, and then given Z, I compute how likely X was. All right, so this is a pure reconstruction loss. Now this second term on the right tells you that if you want to maximize this, including the minus sign, that this distribution that we've now kind of dropped from the sky, this Q of Z given X, right, should be close to the prior distribution of Z. Right? So we have a distribution over Z that has nothing to do with X, just generally tells you what likely Zs are. Here we say that Q of Z must be close to that if we average over a lot of data points. All right? Now it turns out that this is always lower or equal than the log likelihood. So if we maximize, for a given Q, if we maximize this right-hand side with respect, to, with respect to the model parameters theta, if we push that up, we have a large chance of also pushing the log likelihood up. Uh, the likelihood, yeah, the log likelihood up, right? Because I, I have a, a function and I have something that def always lies below it or on top of it, right? So if I push that up, unless there's a big gap between it, I will start pushing up the log likelihood as well. Does that make sense? I see a few people looking at me like, well. <laughs> please tell me, if I interpret your faces correctly, that it's a bit like, huh? please, please tell me what, uh, what is confusing. Well, 
Yes. <coughs> yeah. So it's what it, um, that's a very good question. So it sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? Because it kind of tells you if that's true, if I would make Q of Z given X equal to the prior, I would lose all information on X, right? Now, this is a term, if that was the only term in the loss, that's true. But it's not, right? You have to balance that with the reconstruction loss. So the reconstruction loss in the first, in the first uh, term essentially tells you you can't do that, right? Because otherwise you won't be able to reconstruct the same data point. So this loss is a, is a balance between those terms. And it essentially tells you that you do have to, that the, the if you average this entire loss over multiple data points, it essentially, t the right side of the, of the loss essentially tells you the conditional distribution of Z given X shouldn't lie in a completely different space from which P of Z starts sampling, right? Otherwise, for instance, at sample time, if I'm going to sta start sampling a new data, new Z, and I'm going to push that forward through my decoder, I get totally bad data points, right? So it's, the, the balance of these two, the, these two terms make that problem okay. Any other question? I have a question. Yep. So in a regular also encoded, we have a reconstruction loss such as like, uh, mean squared error. Yep. Why is this also reconstruction loss? So uh, 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 this, if P of theta x, z is a Gaussian distribution, which it typically is, uh, this is a mean squared error. So if you take the logarithm of a Gaussian, right? I take the logarithm of an exponent of minus x squared, right? So the logarithm and exponent, they cancel. And then I get, uh, uh, and because if I minimize, if I want to, this I want to maximize, but if I w want to minimize it, I have to put a minus sign, so the minus sign disappears. Then I get a uh, mean squared error back. So what you're saying, that the reconstruction loss is typically a mean squared error, doesn't conflict with this. It's a special case here if we pick P of theta x comma z to be a Gaussian distribution. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And if we, if you want, we can go over that maybe in the break or something. If that would be helpful. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Okay. So just to recap, instead of optimizing the log likelihood, which you just said we can't really do that we're going to optimize a lower bound to the log likelihood. And we've introduced this new distribution, Q of Z given X, which is a bit like an encoding distribution, right? It tells you, given a data point X, what is the distribution over codes that I get? All right. Okay. Now I'm going to try to explain amortized inference. I have to say that this typically takes a while to settle in. So if you go like, oh my God, what is she talking about? Normal? Let's just go th slowly. So we've talked about this mysterious Q of Z given X, this encoding distribution, but I haven't said anything about you know, what it actually is, right? So for now, I'm going to assume in this first half of the slide that we're not going to associate any neural network with that, right? It is just a distribution, Q of Z given X. Okay. Now I first typically have to choose what family of distributions Q of Z falls into, right? I can say, has to be Gaussian, right? Our favorite distribution typically is a Gaussian because everything becomes easier. Let's, for the sake of the argument, also say here, Q of Z given X will be Gaussian, okay? So that means that in the standard setting, not in the autoencoder setting, I will just define Q of Z given X for each X. So this is called normal variational inference. I, this is not yet an autoencoder, right? So I'm going to optimize in this setting the parameters of Q of Z given X for each X separately. Now this sounds a little bit um, cryptic. Let's say that Q of Z given X is a Gaussian, right? The Gaussian is typically parameterized by a mean and a variance, right? So what this variational, version of variational inference means is that if you give me a new data point X, for each X separately, I will find a new mean and a new variance. Not through a neural network, but I'll just optimize them as learnable parameters, the mean and the variance itself, okay? But each data point gets its own mean and variance. Okay, now that's normal variational inference. In the variational autoencoder, we don't do this type of variational inference, we amortize that cost of trying to find a new mean and a new variance for each data point by essentially learning a mapping from a data point to the mean and the variance if we make everything Gaussian, right? So we, we take a neural network to do that. 
So if we pick Q of Z here, for instance, to be Gaussian, right, or whatever other distribution that has a set of parameters that I need to learn, right, I will now use a neural network to learn a mapping to help us do that so that we don't have to re-optimize that for every new data point. Okay, so uh, to give an example, right, so what we, okay, maybe first take a step back. Let's say that this Q of Z, given X, right, it's a, it's a distribution. I'm going to associate the neural network with it with parameters phi, right? So the generative model had parameters theta. This model has parameters phi. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of only optimizing this lower bound that we had with respect to the model parameters, I'm go also going to optimize it with respect to the uh, encoder parameters, so these phi parameters. Now, for example, what is very often used is that we pick Q to be a Gaussian, oh, Gaussian distribution, right? So that means that it has a mean, oh, sorry, and a variance. And this, for sake of the argument, we're going to pick a, a, a diagonal uh, covariance matrix. So what we need to learn, right, per data point is a mean and a, and a vector of variances. And I'm essentially t going to take a neural network that takes this input X and spits out the corresponding mean and variance. Okay? And the mapping that learns that, right, has this neural network parameters phi. And so if we now, during training, optimize these parameters phi and the model parameters theta, at test time, I can take a new input x and immediately compute the corresponding mean and variance without having to optimize that separately again, right? So I've amortized or reduced the cost or divided the cost of that optimiz optimization procedure by learning a neural network. Okay. Hmm. Yeah? Some questions? Yeah. Do you train that network at the same time as the model? Yes. So, so this, um, when we optimize this evidence lower bound, which is the same one that, that I showed you before, right? At, when I optimize this, I will optimize it with, I will maximize it with respect to both these parameters and the theta parameters of the decoder. Yeah? Questions? Right. Okay. Now, so as I said, typically, um, in the most vanilla case, we pick Q of Z to be a Gaussian, and we also typically then pick the prior to be Gaussian, but standard normal. Now, you can do many other choices, but typically life becomes easier when everything's Gaussian. Uh, Jinwei hates that, so we'll, we can talk about it later. Uh, there. Okay. So, um, taking a step back, Right? So we have now a variational autoencoder. Previously, when I started explaining variational autoencoders, I said there was only a decoder network, right? Because we have defined this, this generative model, right? Which has the prior and the decoder network, right? So there was no autoencoding yet. There was no encoding. But because we now introduced this new distribution Q and we associated a neural network with it, I have an encoding network as well. Right, so now I actually have an autoencoder. Does that make sense? So if I want to train this, if I want to reconstruct, evaluate, for instance, the first term in this loss, right? This is again a reconstruction loss. I take my input and I forward, I essentially forward this through the first half of the neural network, which is Q, right? I get my Z and then I push Z through the second half of the neural network, which is given by P of Z given uh, P of X given Z, I calculate the reconstruction loss. Yeah? Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, can you stress again the difference between the theta and the phi's? Yes. So, theta are, he, the, the thetas live here, and the phi's essentially live here. Right? So phi are the encoder parameters, and theta are the decoder parameters. So decoder is P of X given Z, and sometimes your prior, P of Z, also has parameters. In the vanilla case where you picked it as standard normal, there's no parameters. Yeah? So theta are the parameters for the generative model. At test time, if all we want to do is sample, I can forget about Q, right? And it's parameters phi. 
if I want to do something like representation learning with the code or, or something like that, then I also need to compute for a particular data point set. All right. Okay. Okay, now let's, I don't know, think a little bit about what it means that we're now optimizing this objective with respect to two neural networks, right, that are connected, but we have the encoder network and the decoder network, right? And as I said, we have uh, the encoder parameters are these phi's and the decoder parameters are these thetas. Okay, so we said we would try to optimize or maximize this first line, which is the evidence lower bound with respect to both parameters, right? Now what is interesting to see, as I said, that this is a lower bound to the log likelihood. But we can say something about the gap, right? If it's a lower bound, that means that there's a gap, typically, unless it's exactly equal, between the log likelihood and this objective. Now we can actually compute, that immediately we can compute what that gap would be, okay? So the gap between the log likelihood and this evidence lower bound, which is equal to the top line of the equation, right, the thing we are going to optimize, is exactly the KL divergence between Q of Z given X, right, the encoding distribution, and the models posterior. And now, this model's posterior is typically intractable. And you're gonna maybe think, huh, why? So what we have, right, what we had is we had access to P of X given Z and P of Z, right? If I want to compute the posterior, I can use Bayes' rule, right? to get this, but then I would have to divide by P of X, right? And P of X is the integral of the top line with respect to Z, which means we get this super annoying <laughs> integration again, right? So unless P of X comma Z is something extremely simple, I can't in closed form compute the posterior. Now, despite the fact that we can't in closed form compute this, this is essentially the difference, right, between the objective we're optimizing and the log likelihood. So we can't compute this in closed form, but we do know what its meaning is. We know that if we were to optimize for a given theta, if we would optimize the encoder parameters really, really hard, we would start to get that encoding distribution to be close to the posterior of the model, right? And then, because that's when the KL becomes zero, right? So maximizing the elbow with respect to both the model parameters theta and phi essentially gives me two things. So what you can see is that on the left-hand side, here, this log P of theta x does not depend on phi, right? The right-hand side does depend on phi. Now that means that if I optimize this elbow, which is the right-hand set, this term on the right, with respect to phi, I necessarily have to minimize the KL, right? Because the left-hand side term doesn't depend on phi, so it can't change, right? So if I change one term on the right-hand side, the other term has to compensate for it, right? So if I increase the elbow, the KL divergence has to decrease, right? So by maximizing the elbow with respect to phi, I'm minimizing the KL, okay? So I'm essentially ensuring that this encoding distribution becomes a better approximation of this model posterior, which is intractable. Okay. Now, secondly, by maximizing this elbow, right, on the right-hand side, with respect to the model parameters theta, I'm also pushing up the log likelihood. So I am still, and that was our original objective, right? We wanted to maximize log likelihood. So I'm also still optimizing log likelihood, right? And that was my generative modeling uh, objective. So at the same time with the variational autoencoder, I'm doing representation learning, right? I'm learning and I'm doing inference with, a, with, with my encoding distribution. But I'm also learning a generative model. So at test time, I can do both of these things. Yeah? Questions? All right, let me see. Okay, now let's say that that's all done. We're all in complete agreement that that makes sense. Now, hmm, we actually do have to optimize this objective, right? And let's first have a look at how we would optimize this objective with respect to the model parameters, the decoder parameters. And then we'll see that that's fairly straightforward, 
and we'll see that the optimizing with respect to the encoder parameters is slightly less straightforward. Okay, so, but let's do the straightforward thing first. So what we want to do, right, is we want to essentially do uh, the standard thing we all do all day, backprop of this objective with respect to our uh, decoder parameters. Okay, so that means that we have to compute the gradient with respect to theta of our loss function. And that's essentially, on the right-hand side, just focus on the first line, please, uh, we get the gradient of this term here. Now, a gradient and then taking an expectation, right, if we want to sample, you have to be a bit careful. In this case, the distribution from which we're sampling, Q, doesn't depend on theta. So I can swap them, no problem. I can swap the order, okay? So I can pull this gradient inside of the expectation. Then I'm in the second line and compute the gradient with respect to these two terms. Now the second term doesn't depend on theta, so I can forget about it, right? So I'm left with only the gradient of the first term. Now I can compute that gradient based on stochastically drawn samples for the expectation operator, right? So here I still had expectation over the gradient of these two terms, right? I can first take the expectation, I can draw samples from Q of Z comma X, right, with Monte Carlo estimates. Let's say I do something very simple, I draw a single sample, Q of Z given X, right? And for that Z, I will evaluate these two terms, but because the second gradient is zero, I only have to evaluate this gradient, okay? So there's no problem here. I can essentially take, draw a sample, Q of Z given X, and then calculate this gradient, do backprop, all good, no problem. All right? Okay, now let's go to the second one. Now we're going to try to do the same, but for the encoder parameters. So we're going to again take the gradient with respect to phi of our objective, which means that again we have to take the gradient with respect to phi. Oh, now it stopped working, great. And here's the expectation, and now I hope I've been very obvious, uh, and if not, that's a pity. Can anybody tell me why I can't swap these two operators? The Sorry? The Can you speak up a little, sir? The oh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry. Leibniz rule, is that what you said? Okay, sorry, I had trouble hearing you. Um, yes, so essentially the sampling here, right, which we can write as an integral, depends on the parameters phi. So I can't just ignore the fact that the sampling depends on phi and, you know, swap those orders. That doesn't work, right? So this <laughs> is not allowed. Sounds very nice, but I can't do that. And we were allowed to do that with the, with the other parameters, right? Okay, so we have to find another way, right? We don't want to differentiate through a sampling procedure that depends on the parameters that we're going to optimize. That doesn't work. All right. Now, what was um, uh, proposed in the paper by Dirk Kingma and also by Danilo Rosenda, which they kind of appeared at the same time, uh, which was an essential trick here for uh, making variation autoencoders work, is the reparameterization trick. And if you take a step back, what it does is when you sample, it separates the stochasticity from the sampling from the parameters that the sampling depends on. Okay, now that sounds a bit cryptic, but let's go through it. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to rewrite this sampling operator, operation where we take Z and we, and we sample it from this distribution Q of Z given X, which depends on phi. And we're going to write it as a deterministic transformation of another sampling procedure where the sampling procedure no longer depends on phi, but the deterministic function does. And then we can get away with swapping things again. Okay, so in equations, what we're going to do is we're going to say Z, this random variable, is a, uh, a deterministic function G that takes in another random variable, epsilon, which if I want to sample that, that this distribution should not depend, this P should not depend on phi, otherwise we haven't solved our problem. And because it's conditioned on X, right, uh, it can take X. And this determination function, deterministic function can also depend on phi, but epsilon cannot depend on phi. That's the crucial thing. 
right? And epsilon is the, is the new stochastic random variable. Then, if we've done that, if we have something of this form, which is a simplification, or say an abstract, abstraction of what we've seen before, if we want to take the gradient with respect to phi of an expectation of this Q phi Z given X, and then something inside the expectation, some function F, doesn't really matter what it is, that depends on Z, this is equivalent to saying we take the gradient of the expectation where instead of sampling Z, comma X, we sample epsilon, right? And given epsilon, we can compute Z, right? So Z is a function of epsilon, right? So we evaluate this. And now what we're allowed to do, now we're allowed to swap the gradient and the expectation, right? Because the expectation here doesn't depend on phi. Okay, so now we're allowed to do it. We can draw the gradient inside this expectation, take one Monte Carlo estimate, one, one Monte Carlo sample to compute this expectation, and do back problem. Okay? So let's make this, um, say in a picture, this is what essentially happens. So before we did this reparameterization trick, let's look at the original form here on the left. Okay? So what we did is we had a latent variable, a random variable, Z, right? And randomness here is indicated by the fact that that node is blue, right? In order to get Z, right, I had to, you had to give me the parameters phi and X, and then I would start randomly sampling Z, right? But phi and X are deterministic in this case. Okay. And then I had F, and what I, what I needed to do, right, is optimize phi. But that means that if I want to backprop, no matter where I go, right, here, there is a sampling procedure in between, which you typically don't really know how to differentiate through. Now, what the reparameterized form essentially does, it kind of rewrites the computation graph in such a way that Z is now a de deterministic node, but takes as input a stochastic node, another one, epsilon, right? And takes into two other, again, deterministic nodes, phi and x. Now, if I want to backprop, right, from F to phi, you see there's no stochasticity on its path anymore, right? So there's no problem. That's a bit more the pictorial view of why this does work. All right, any questions on that? We, we, in the next slide, we'll go through this with a Gaussian example, just to make it a bit more concrete. All right, we don't have a lot of time. I said I'd stop at 45, so hmm, challenge. Um, let's do this. Uh, okay, well, I've just explained. Here, this slide is not super important. It's, it's just to show you that this is where f, this abstract function we had before, is now just our objective function, right? So we say we wanted to calculate the gradient with respect to phi, I'm just not working, right, of this elbow. And now here there was an expectation with respect to Q, right? You can see that here at the top. And we can use the, the, the reparameterization trick to replace that by an expectation over P of epsilon that no longer depends on phi, and we can pull all gradient through, no problem. Yeah? Okay, now let's do this for one example for the uh, uh, simplest Gaussian version that you know, was used originally. So typically, in a vanilla version, we take Q of phi, Z comma X, to be a factorized Gaussian, meaning that for each dimension, it is a separate Gaussian, right? Which is the same as saying it's a high-dimensional Gaussian with diagonal covariance, right? If we parameterize that with the encoder network, we have to parameterize a mean vector and a vector for the uh, diagonal terms on the covariance matrix. All right. Now, if we want to reparameterize this, what we do is we first sample epsilon from a standard normal distribution. Zero mean, identity covariant, right? No dependence on any neural network parameters. Now, if we, with that sample, want to sample from this distribution, this Q, right? What we do is we take uh, as an input for a neural network, X, we produce mu and the logarithm of sigma, and then we exponentiate that or we do something else with it that makes it, the logarithm go away. Um, and then we can draw a sample from Q by saying Z is mu plus this vector sigma element-wise multiplied with this sample epsilon. Okay? And this is the reparameterization trick for Gaussians. Any questions? 
Yeah, good. Okay. Now we can do the, I think the full covariance is a bit boring. Um, now it turns out compared to other autoencoders that existed before a variational autoencoder, this works, optimi optimizing this works better. What you see here are results for MNIST. At the time, MNIST was still cool. Um, uh, compared to something called a wake sleep algorithm for optimizing autoencoders, uh, the wake sleep algorithms are in green, and the uh, autoencoding variational base, which it was called at that time, is indicated in red. And what is on the y axis are, is the uh, uh, lower bound of the uh, log likelihood, right? So you want, you want that to be higher. And you'll see this as a function of training. As, as a, the x-axis is the num number of training samples that it's actually uh, uh, absorbed. Now you can see that this works a little bit better. That's great. And on the bottom row, you see fray phase, also good. Now, of course, this was in 2014, long time ago, for deep learning standards. Um, in the meantime, variation autoencoders have become incredibly popular. You can do all types of other strict with fancy architectures, and this actually works uh, quite well. Now, I think I'll stop with that. Let me have a quick, yeah, okay, great. Good ending. Uh, I think we can take a 15 minutes break and then we'll continue on with normalizing flows. All right. get started. I know not all of you are here yet. I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> slowly people will come back in. Um, I'll just start talking a little bit and then uh, we'll see. Sorry? Oh, well, I don't know. I think, I think other people might prefer the diffusion models, but let's see. <laughs> um, okay. So we're going to discuss normalizing flows now. I know that we've only done 45 minutes of VAEs and there's much more to cover for VAEs. But I'd rather do, say, the basics of all of the three sections than to go into, you know, this is that architecture improvement and stuff. I think that might be nicer to do by self-reading or something. Okay? All right. Okay, so now we're going to do normalizing flows for the next 45 minutes. Um, but we'll start by motivating normalizing flows by going back to variational autoencoders. And actually the motivation is... Um, based on something that one of you just asked me. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll go through that. Okay. Uh, by the way, if I, sometimes I have a tendency because I use this pen to point at something while not actually writing. Um, uh, uh, please tell me if I'm doing that. Right? So if I go like, yeah, yeah, this term here and you have no idea what I'm looking at, uh, uh, please you know, tell me, can you please you know, write with your pen? Otherwise, uh, okay. Okay. So, recap variational autoencoders, yeah? We had a surrogate objective that we were going to optimize instead of the log likelihood, because the log likelihood was intractable, okay? Where we had this new distribution, the encoding distribution, which together with this will give you a reconstruction term, and we had this sort of regularization term, okay? And we also already discussed that um, this this equation on the right, the evidence lower bound, is actually equal to the log likelihood minus this KL between the encoding distribution and the true posterior of the model, right? That is this thing. This intractable thing, we don't know how to compute. But this KL tells us that this is the difference between the objective we were optimizing and the thing we actually wanted to optimize, which is the log likelihood. Okay? All right. Okay, um, Jinwei will very kindly send the PDF of the slides to you, or to someone who will then send it to you. I don't know how it's going to end up with you guys. Um, so I hope that will make things a little easier. Okay, for those of you who just came in, um, I've just recapped variational autoencoders, and we're going to use that as a motivation to do normalizing flows. Okay? So, repeat, we were optimizing the evidence lower bound, Right, which is a lower bound to the log likelihood. 
And the difference between that evidence lower bound and the log likelihood is this KL divergence, that one, between the encoding distribution and the posterior of the model. Okay. So that means that if we optimize the evidence lower bound, we are trying to approximate Q to go towards this true distribution P of Z given X. But that also means that if it's a bad approximation, there's a huge gap, right, between the log likelihood, the objective we actually wanted to do, and the one we're optimizing. So let's, in a picture, see what that means. Let's say, for the sake of the argument, that I'm going to fix my encoding distribution. So phi is fixed, I'm not optimizing anything, right? The only thing I'm now going to optimize is the model parameters of the decoder distribution, okay? Now, let's pretend there's only a single parameter. That's not true, but just for sake of the argument. So what I wanted to do is find the parameters of theta that maximize the log likelihood, right? So I, if, if the log likelihood is here drawn as this red curve, right, I want to find the values of theta that corresponds to theta star, right? That's the maximum of this curve. What I'm doing instead is I am maximizing the blue curve, which is always below or on top of this red curve. And the gap between these two curves is the KL divergence between the encoding distribution and the posterior of your model. Now you can imagine that if your encoding distribution is not, if, if that gap is big, right, the optimum of the blue curve, which we're optimizing, does not lie at the same position as the optimum of the red curve, right? So if our goal is to do log likelihood optimization, then we better make sure that this encoding distribution is flexible enough that it can close this gap. Yeah? Okay. And now what we've done so far is only looked at Gaussians with uh, diagonal covariance, right? I mean, that is probably as, okay, not as inflexible as you can get, but it's not very flexible, right? So what we're going to try to do now is look at normalizing flows and how you can use that to model a more flexible Q of Z given X. If you have a question, please ask. All right, otherwise the 45 minutes will be very long, probably for you and me. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, what we're going to do now is uh, introduce normalizing flows for variational inference for, for autoencoders, and this is how it was done by Danilo Rezende and Shakir Mohammed in 2015. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to start with a simple distribution, the one we already had, probably a diagonal Gaussian, right? So I'm going to start by taking a sample from a latent variable Z, which is conditioned on X, through this very simple Gaussian distribution. So if I draw that on the right-hand side, because it's for a 2D latent variable, right? This can only be, this can be an elongated sort of like ellipse, but it can't be, it can either lie along this axis or along this axis, right? Otherwise, if it would be diagonal, there would be correlation among its elements, right? So now, the minimum thing that I want to be able to do is to do something so that I can actually model correlations. But what I'd also kind of like is for this to not be unimodal, right? This is a distribution that has a single mode. But there is no, if you have a, any type of uncomplicated model, you, you can't guarantee that the distribution that we are trying to match, P of Z given X, which we don't know, is unimodal. There's no reason why that would be the case, right? So ideally, we, we, we would start building a, uh, we'd start building an encoding distribution that can do multiple modes and do correlations, okay? All right. Now, what we're going to do is take this sample, Z0, from this uh, 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 simple Gaussian distribution I'm going to apply a sequence of invertible transformations. And the invertibility here is important. If it's not invertible, we have a problem. And invertible means that if I take um, Z0 and I apply a, that invertible function to it, I get another Z, right? Different type, let's call it Z1. Given that Z1, I can always find back Z0, right? Okay, so given that sequence of invertible transformations, which I'm going to denote with these functions F1 to Fk, so I have now a sequence of length k. Because these are invertible, what I've essentially done is created a sequence of random variables, right? So I started with Z0, which was generated by Q, which was a simple Gaussian. I transformed it once with 
some type of invertible transformation, and I get Z1, etc. And so at the end, I end up with Zk. Yeah? And I do that with invertible transformations F. Now, what that means is that if these Fs, these functions, are very flexible, still invertible, uh, I essentially created random variables which can have very different distributions. Right? So let's say the first one doesn't introduce a new mode, but it does introduce some correlations. Yeah? Now, the more and more I keep doing that, the more strange uh, uh, the distribution can look of that last random variable. Right? So I get a new random variable, but the distribution of that random variable can be very different from the original random variable that I sampled from my Gaussian. Okay. Now let's look a little bit on how we can actually get the distribution, because we need to be able to evaluate that density. Okay. Now here I just repeated mostly what was on the previous slide. Um, now what we know is that if you would give me the density of random variable Zk minus 1, right? So I have applied k minus 1 transformations already to Z0. If you would give me the density of that, oh, sorry. If you would give me Q, like the, the distribution of Zk minus 1, and if you would be able to evaluate the determinant of this matrix, right? So this is a matrix of fk, which is essentially zk, right? Which is f applied to zk minus 1, right? We make a matrix, matrix out of that. We take, a great, we take the derivative of that with respect to the input, and we get a matrix, right? And the matrix is essentially, uh, here, let me do it here. This would be zk, uh, dzk minus 1, and it has elements ij if I take the ith element of zk and the jth element of zk minus 1. Yeah? So this is a matrix, right? If we take the determinant of that, absolute value inverted, then I can tell you what the density is of the next random variable. Which means that if I would apply that recursively, as long as I know the density of the first random variable that I put into the sequence, which we said was Gaussian, right? I can recursively start computing the densities of the entire sequence of random variables, right? So that means that if I start with the, if I want to know what the log density is of the kth random variable, I take the log density of the original random variable, right? And that was here, right? We sampled that from the Gaussian. And now I subtract the sum of the log determinants of these matrices. Right? We have k matrices. And this means that even though I've done some really weird stuff, the, likely, the density, or the log density, is still tractable, which is what we want if we want to plug this in back to a, an autoencoder, right? Because we have all types of terms that depend on us evaluating the density of the encoder. Uh, why that's the case? Aha, okay. Well, um, hmm. I can do that. Um, that might take a while, though. Um, okay. Are there other people who also want to hear that? Because it, it will probably take me five minutes. Let's do it in the break. Maybe everybody who's interested in can come in the break, which is at uh, a quarter to 11. I'll do it on the whiteboard. Okay? All right. Good. Um, okay. So for now, let's assume that the equation is true. Yeah? And that I didn't make a typo or something. Yeah? Is the that you have Should it be Z or F? Uh, in, in the here? Yeah. That's, oh, that's the, so, okay. So, so. That doesn't really matter. So we say that um, Zk is F of if Fk applied to Zk minus 1. So it's a bit of an overloading of terms. Does, it, does that make sense? No? 
No, f is not a PDF. f is a function. So the, 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 the uh, 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 PDF are queues. So f is literally just a function that maps an input of, in this case, say, d dimensions to another d dimensions. So that means that if you input a random variable as its input, it's going to spit out another random variable of the same size. Yeah? If it's invertible, not. That's why, uh, um, so the, 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 the point of an invertible function is that, that the determinant is not zero, which is also why it's important that it's invertible. That's a very good point. So we're going to apply this not. Uh, so we have to take care of where we're going to apply this in the autoencoder. So we're going to, I don't know actually if I have this on the slide. Let me check, otherwise I'll make a quick drawing on the board. No. Okay. Um, so we had this, um, this was the autoencoder, right? Which goes, say so if this is the input X, right? goes to a bottleneck, Z, which typically has smaller size, right? And then it went back to the original size. Now what we're going to do is, uh, and so the, here we had parameters phi, and here we had parameters theta, right? And so we said that, um, I'm trying to write without standing in front of all of you. Um, we said that Q of phi defined the distribution of z given x, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to first write this as a simple distribution, right? Which is conditional on x, but it acts on z, right? So this will be a Gaussian distribution. Um, and then on top of that, I'm going to apply a normalizing flow, which will only stay in the dimension of z. So the normalizing flow doesn't go into a bottleneck. The normalizing flow essentially kind of lives in here a little bit. Yeah? So then it's invertible on z-space, but it, it doesn't really do anything except taking x as some auxiliary input. It doesn't need to be invertible with respect to x. But it's a very good question. Um, any other questions? All right. Okay. Uh, next. Okay. So we're going to try to apply normalizing flows to the encoding distribution, right? So to repeat, we will first take x as an input to a simple Gaussian distribution that we had before, right? And then on z space, I'm going to apply invertible transformations, right? And at the end, what I do need to do, right? I'm going to essentially say this is the encoding distribution, right? And if I want to optimize the original objective I had, right, I need to be able to evaluate this density and sample from it, right? And because I have to do this a lot, there are some practical requirements to this, right? So first, because you have to apply this sequence, the goal that we had, right, is to be very flexible, right? To, 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 is to say we want to present multimodal distributions and correlations and et cetera. Now, if that would require uh, 100 transformations, Right? Because we have to do them in sequence, the runtime of our model becomes somewhat prohibitively large. Right? So ideally, we pick each of these, say, FKs to be super flexible, such that in only a few amount of steps, I can reach a multimodal distribution if I need it and get some correlations. Okay? So we want flexible but invertible transformations. Okay? Okay? Now, the other thing is that we, we said we needed to evaluate the density, right? And in order to evaluate the density, we had the sum of the logs of the determinant, right? So we have to compute these determinants over matrices, and determinants are not super cheap, right? They scale naively to, uh, n, to the, uh, n to the cube, where n is the size of the dimension of the matrix, right? So if we do that with any matrix, this is going to be very expensive, right? So we kind of want to make sure that f is invertible, it's flexible, but not so flexible that it's like full determinant. If we do something smart to the structure of the matrix, then determinants are easier to compute, right? And then we can get away with an easier scaling that is not n to the third. Okay. Uh, okay, so these are flexible, uh, these are the sort of practical requirements. Now, 
this was the, okay, it's, it's not exactly the first time normalizing flows were introduced, but I would say the one that popularized it, let's, let's put it this way. And this was then, as we just talked about now, right, applied to variational autoencoders. And the first version that was introduced here was by Danilo Zende and Shakir Mohammed, was this extremely simple transformation, okay? You take as input Z, right, here, this is here depicted, right, it's just a vector. Now, I'm going to just add that as a sort of like a residual connection. I'm also going to multiply it, take the inner product with a weight vector, not a matrix, just a vector, right? I get out of scalar. I add a bias. I apply some tan H nonlinearity, okay? Do an element-wise multiplication of that scalar that comes out with a new set of parameters, U, and add back the original set. Now, if you put some constraints on U and W, these vectors, then this is invertible. Uh, and this is super easy to execute. And because of this funny form, there's also a very simple form for its determinant. Right, so this determinant is, is extremely quick to compute. Now, the only thing it's not is that it's not very flexible, but it is very simple. Now, this showed that what you see on the left here is the, the negative of the, of the lower bound that we were optimizing, so lower is better. They showed that if you add more, if you make, increase the length of the sequence, which is the x-axis on these plots on the left, right, that the negative to lower bound becomes lower and lower, which is what we wanted, right? And on the right, you see some numbers for that, where here on the top, here, you can see how the lower bound or the negative lower bound uh, decreases as a function of the number of the, of the length of the sequence, right? And you can see that this becomes lower and lower. So what we've done, what they've shown here is that if you make your encoding distribution more flexible, with normalizing flows, this you know helps you optimize your log likelihood better. Questions on that, or everything that we've discussed after the break? No. Okay. Okay. Now this was normalizing flows for variational autoencoders, but normalizing flows can also just be applied by themselves. They don't need to be applied in the framework of a variational autoencoder, right? What we've done with the VAE is we've said we had this latent variable and we want to apply the normalizing flow on that level, right? What we could have also done is just said, I want to apply the normalizing flow directly on the data space. Much higher dimensional typically, right? So it becomes scales maybe somewhat poorly, but we could do that, right? Okay, so let's, let's have a look at that. Okay, so... Um, the idea is, as before, we're going to take a latent variable. This time, we're going to say that Z has the same dimensionality as the data X. Okay, so now we will have to do that. Okay, and we're going to say Z0 is now sampled from a prior distribution that knows nothing about X, right? It's just a standard normal, for instance, okay? And now I'm going to apply, again, a sequence of transformations that is now mapping from, you know, the size of the data to the size of the data, and hope again that I get something flexible out. Now let's say I do that twice, which nobody ever does in practice, but let's say for the sake of the argument, we do it twice. What we're going to do is we're going to associate the random variable after two transformations with the data random variable x, okay? So we're essentially saying z2 is x, okay? Now, in order to, if I then want to, say, get my Z0 that correspond to an X that I get from a data distribution, what I do is I go in the inverse direction of the sequence that I applied, right? And because they're all invertible transformations, I can do that, right? So I take an input X and I push it through the inverse of F2, right? That means I get n now a latent variable Z1, which is of the same size as X, right? And again, I now push Z1 through the inverse of F1. Okay, now I get Z0 out. Okay. Now, you can see that because I'm going to do this during training a lot, and I'll explain in a second why I'm going to do that, I have an additional practical requirement that I haven't mentioned before, right? Before I said it has to be invertible, but I never said you had to evaluate the inverse. Right? 
I said the determinant has to be easy to compute and it has to be somewhat flexible. But I just said that the inverse needs to exist. But what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to evaluate the inverse. So that means that the inverse shouldn't only exist, I should probably be able to evaluate it in closed form or have a very fast numerical estimate of it. Right? And that's, uh, that's a constraint we didn't have in the, in the VE version of it. Okay. So that's an additional practical requirement. Um, okay. Now what I want, now I think I left something out which is quite crucial, which is a bit silly. Yeah, okay. Now I'll just write it on my pen now. What I want to do, right, is maximize the log likelihood. Right, so I want to essentially say, sorry, I want to do, I want to maximize this, right? That's what we've been doing all day so far. And now it feels a bit like this is disconnected from what I've just said, perhaps. Now what I'm gonna say is if I want to calculate the log likelihood of x, right, I'm going to write this as the log of dz0, right, of p of z0, right? I know that density because it's the very simple standard normal, right? And I know that I can get z0, the exact z0 that corresponds to x by just going in the reverse direction of the, all the transformations, right? And now I think all I need to do, now I have to be, make sure that I get the sign correct. Um, top k of log of the determinant of um, dz k z k minus one. Okay, so what is interesting now is that where in a VE case, I couldn't compute the log likelihood in closed form, right? I had to go through the lower bound. But now, because I've applied a normalizing flow on the data space, and because I've constrained all the transformations to be invertible, I can compute the log likelihood in closed form. So there's no lower bound, no gap, no nothing. I can actually compute the log likelihood of the model, which is not the case for a VE, right? With the constraint, that I have to put my neural networks in such a way that I make everything invertible, which is quite a constraint actually. But we can probably do, do some funny tricks with that. Does that make sense for everyone? Are you sure? Some people look at me a little bit like, hey. Yeah. No, so the inverse actually, if I didn't mess up the minus sign, is here, right? So you take the logarithm of something to the power of minus one, gets the mi it gets the minus one in front of it. So, so, uh, oh, I can't write anymore. X to the power n, right, is n log x. Any, you also had a question? Ah, yeah, okay. So uh, maybe we can go back two slides. Yeah, okay, let me erase this for a second. So imagine that this, um, this thing here, that we're doing this all on the same space as the data, right? If you would give me the density of Zk, I can compute the density of Zk plus one or minus one, right, through this formula. But the only density I really know is Z0, the original one, at, you know, that is standard normal in our case. So, but what I want to do in, so I'm going to recursively apply this equation K times. And that is why, if I, and if I then com combine that with a logarithm, right, I get something that is a sum, like this. Right, so what we do in pictures is that I essentially take X, I pass it through k inverses, and I remember all of those variables, right? And I essentially add up the densities uh, of all of those things. Yeah? Is it, is it not contained in z0? Or? So it is kind of contained in z0. So it's contained in z0 in the sense that you have this term, right? 
But because you do invertible transformations, what you're essentially doing is squeezing and, uh, and, and, and stretching the density, right? So what you, what you have to be careful is that if you do a transformation, right, that you uh, don't, that the resulting density is still normalized. And this, these terms are essentially corrections to make it normalized still. And that becomes a bit more obvious if you write it not as a log likelihood, but as a likelihood. Um, then this essentially just tells you, please stay normalized. Yeah. So, like, so for instance, uh, we, we are getting like batches of what, like, like, for example, the uh, images. So, after the session, it's uh, after the product play. But my main question is, do you actually need like, to have like, this uh, PDF after each step? or? just look like 20 linear layers after the uh, sampling Gaussian and just put it inside the decoder mm -hmm. it make a similar difference? Um, let, let me try to see if I understand. I'll, I'll try to repeat it and then you can tell me if that was your question. Okay. So, are you asking whether or not we can do, we can do normalizing flows like this, right? Yeah. Or just if we were to do a VAE, Increase the flexibility of my decoder. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. um, in this framework, so the question is do we need the PDF after each sequence? Yeah. Within each sequence, right? Yeah. Well, so, okay, so the difference here is that we're interested in the unconditional distribution of the input, right? And now, I need, if I want that, the only way that this computes that by doing the whole sequence, right? And I, and I rely on knowing the determinants to compute that result. Now, in the, in, when I do this for a decoder for a, a VAE, I'm not interested in, in the unconditional distribution, right? I'm interested in P of X given Z. Now there, it doesn't need to be invertible with respect to x and z, right? But so I'm modeling a conditional distribution in one and a marginal distribution in the other. So now I don't think you, uh, so, so that, that's to say technical difference. Now I do think that, you know, VEs and normalizing flows in the end, I don't know, I think there's probably, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm sure there's people who will disagree with me. I'm not sure there's really, you, you can say that there's, uh, that one is strictly less powerful than the other one. Uh, so you can, you can increase flexibility in either, but if you want to compute the marginal distribution of the input with a normalized flow like this, you have to do this. You can't start, in, increase, start putting non-invertible layers in between. Otherwise you lose the, like then you get a determinant that is zero in between, right? And then we're done, right? Then we get here, we get a log. One of these terms will be a log of zero and that explodes. Yeah. A very good question. I think it would only do that if you would make it, and I have to think a little bit, if you would make it invertible. If you would make the encoder and decoder architectures invertible. Not sure if it's both, but certainly you need to have, have an invertibility constraint. Otherwise, you would still, like, because a normal VAE, if you, it's a lower bound regardless of what you pick the dimensionality of Z, right? Yeah. It becomes a non lower bound if you make it an invertible transformation. Mm -hmm. Because then you can also compute the posterior and whatever, and you get, okay, you get a lot of delta distributions, which gets a bit ugly, but. So then, the posterior just like then the posterior is a delta distribution. Okay. Okay, so, th so the question is how deep, how, what should K be, right? Well, that's a, a, a one of these lovely ex additional hyperparameters that you'll have to tune that will uh, determine both your runtime, right, and your flexibility. So you have to get a bit of a trade off to what, you know, in terms of flexibility, but also in terms of runtime. Yeah. And in variational encoder, it's, you cannot really absorb, even approximate the 
it, it's hard to do that. Uh, here we have a closed form for it. In a variation or autoencoder, you can compute a lower bound to it, and there's tricks to compute tighter lower bounds to it, but they're all numerical estimates. Mm. So. But what is the intuition that we have the, the value of the K, like, as we go higher in its value, what changes? So the intuition is what yeah. high K would you so give? You've essentially, so going high, making K higher, so increasing the number of invertible layers, essentially tells you that you can make more and more, flex, more, and more crazy distributions if you wanted to model them. Um, so let's say that the true posterior is something with, uh, I don't know, 500 modes and uh, super correlated, super dependent, right? It might be that with two layers you won't get there, right? So you, if, if, if your goal is to get something good. Yeah? Right, one last question, yep. Is, is the question if the normalizing, f if, if in this setting the base distribution has to have a smaller dimensionality? No. If you, yeah, but if you want to have a tractable uh, uh, um, uh, expression for your log likelihood of the data, you should keep the dimensionality of the base distribution, this Z0, the same. Otherwise you, yeah, otherwise you get back to something that is actually much more similar to a normalized, to a VE. Right, because if, if I don't do that, then I go from, say, let's say it's a lower dimension, right? Then somewhere in there I will have a, a mapping from a lower dimension to a higher dimension, and that is per definition not invertible, right? So, so then I have a determinant zero somewhere and then get all types of stuff. Now I can do other stuff. I can introduce auxiliary random variables and do fancy stuff. But then again, I go back to something that's much more similar to a variational uh, uh, autoencoder. Uh, I actually think Chinway has a very nice paper on that. So, uh, no? Okay. I usually pay attention. Okay. Um, all right. Now we'll go through two examples of generative, people sometimes call these generative normalizing flows because they're not used inside a variational autoencoder. We'll go through two examples that are very similar, simple, but actually work quite well. Okay, so one of the simplest ones is um, called Real NVP uh, by uh, Lauren Din, uh, Yasha Schuldigstein, and uh, Joshua Benjo. Um, and um, it as, goes as follows. So here I'm going to show one transformation only. Uh, where we go from data oh, to, say, a latent variable, okay? Now, you take the data, which I'll denote with x, and I split it into two. It's your choice how to split it into two, but you split the dimensions in two. Let's say the image, you split it across its channels, for instance, right? You take the first two channels and the, and the, and the last channel, or you split the image in half over the middle, or you pick a checkerboard pattern, whatever you want, but you split it in two. Okay? And you get x1 and x2. So x1 and x2 together, if you concatenate them back, will form the original image. Now, the next random variable, right, which is going to be a random variable that we get after, after applying this invertible transformation, is going to look as follows. The first half of it, which we'll denote with z1, is exactly the equal as to x1. Okay? So nothing happens to the first half. The second half, though, is going to be first taking the x2, right, the second half of x, multiplying it with a function or a scalar that is parameterized by a neural network that takes as input this first part of x that we left unchanged. Right, so just the scalar uh, uh, that is modeled by a neural network. The neural network does not need to be invertible, right? This whole function is invertible, but the neural network itself does not need to be. Right? It takes this input x1 and it spits out, a, uh, uh, sorry, it's not a scalar, it spits out a vector that is of the same size of x2. Yeah? Now, what comes out, I'm going to translate that, and the translation is again a vector of the same size as x2, but it will depend, it will be modeled with a neural network that takes this input x1 and spits out something of the same size as x2. Okay? Now, I'm going to, this whole result, I'm going to concatenate back with x1, and that's my new random variable. All right, so recap, split into two, essentially 
copy over the first part to the new random variable, to the first half of the new random variable, but use that also as input to a very simple linear function that will determine what the second half of your new random variable is. Now, it turns out that this is super easy to invert, which is great, right? Now we're going to go in the other direction. Someone gives me Z1 and Z2, and I have to produce X1 and X2, right? Now, we know that nothing happened to X1, so we can just say that X1 is Z1, right? No problem. So we've already recovered half of X. Now, I'm going to take Z1 and input that into that scale network, this one, and the translation, right? Because originally we put X1 in there, but we know that X1 is Z1, so we can just put Z1 in there, right? So now we have the scale and translation. So we can take Z2, which we were also given, subtract the translation, and divide out the scale, and now we have X1 back. <coughs> yeah? All right. Now, the nice thing is that this overall is a invertible transformation, but the neural networks don't need to be inverted. Yeah. Now, this name, real NVP, comes from the fact that these scales, one second, then I'll, then I'll get to you, um, make this a non-volume preserving flow. And this non-volume preserving flow relates to all of those determinants that, that I think you asked about, right? Why are they there? They're there to normalize the distribution back, right? Now, you can also come up with many invertible transformations where the normalization correction is just, like, depending on you put it in log or zero, there is no normalization correction, right? But for invertible transformations, what you have to correct, they're called non-volume preserving. And because of this scale in here, it's non-volume preserving. And this determinant is essentially a, a, um, a product of the diagonal of all those scales. So it's a very simple determinant also, and that works. Yeah. Uh, this was actually quite successful, I would have to say. At the time, these, this is 2016, these were quite high quality images, right? Uh, and this is this normalizing flow trained directly on the data. And now you had a question, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? So you just, that just the last sentence, I understood the first. Uh, uh, how, what would be an example of a such division? I'm not sure I get what, what exactly are dividing in x1 and x2 here. Because, for example, if we generate... Okay, let's say that we do something very silly. We, don't, we, we split up the image, which has three channels, not on its channel, channel axis, but literally in the middle of the image. So I will now have two non-square images, <coughs> right? which is uh, X1 is the left half of the image with three channels. X2 is the right half of the image. Now, then you have a neural network that takes as input something of the size of that half, that image, and spits out something that is of the same size, right? And that will be the scale that we multiply or divide by. Yeah? Any other questions? All right. Okay. Um, now the other thing, the other one that was quite popular, maybe slightly less pragmatic, but was quite popular, is to make an autoregressive flow. Um, so here, what we do is, we, in the data that goes from Z0, sorry, in the direction that goes from Z0 to data, right, we make an autoregressive transformation. What does that mean? That means that if I want to compute, say, X from its previous latent version, Xi, so the i-th dimension, only depends on Zi minus 1 and any of the lower dimensions, right? So we have like a triangular dependence. So here we can see Xi is given by some uh, term, mu i, that only depends on the previous X, X minus 1, right? So there is, I'm kind of making a uh, yeah, triangular dependence of the, of the random variables. And that means that in the other direction, when we go from data to latent, this is no longer autoregressive, uh, and we can compute it all in parallel. Right, so at sampling time, when we go 
here, we take the top box. This is really slow to sample, right? I have to sample x1 first, and then x2, right? So this is, this is quite slow. All right. Um, now, the last thing I want to mention is uh, called GLOW, which was uh, proposed by uh, Diederik Kingma and his coworker. Um, here, one of the things they did is, in real MVP, the, fl the flow that we talked, not the last one, but the one before, we discussed this sort of like splitting of the data, right? You have to split your one data point into two pieces. Now you can imagine that the choice of splitting here, again, is some type of hyperparameter, and it's up to the fantasy of whoever implements this on what to do. Um, and typically, one of the things people do is they literally say, let's take the input, shuffle it, and then split it, right? And let's do different shuffles every time we apply this transformation. Now, it's possible, Th that works actually pretty well. What they did here is they said, Okay, but a permutation operation, right? The shuffling is a little bit similar to a one-by-one uh, one one convolution. At least it's a special case of it. So let's just do one-by-one one convolutions instead of permutations. Make sure they're invertible, because otherwise we're still in trouble. Um, and do that, plus a lot of other tricks to make that work better. And here, uh, I guess the, the point they wanted to make is that normalizing flows actually do scale really well to high-dimensional data. Well, it can be a bit complicated, but it does work, and they got much better image quality. All right, um, so we're going to do the last part uh, on the noise diffusion models. We have until 12. Supposedly some alarm goes off at 12, so that'll be a good uh, stopping point. Um, before I start, I want to uh, give a quick shout-out to two people who are not here, but who are part of the team that uh, Jinwei and Victor and I uh, work on, uh, Daniel and Sarah. They've given some diffusion model lectures uh, in our internal study group, and I use part of their slides as a starting point. Yeah? All right. Good. Now, we're going to try to figure out what a diffusion model is. They've become incredibly popular. I think they're probably one of the most popular diffusion models uh, that are used today. Um, now, what is a diffusion model? A diffusion model pictorially takes a data point that you see here on the uh, bottom left as this picture of this uh, cute cat. Um, and there is a non-learnable process that is typically fixed that slowly adds more noise to that image until you get completely white noise, right? So that is in this direction, which there's multiple convention. In this convention on these slides, it's called the forward process, yeah? Okay, now the generative model essentially learns the inverse direction. It says, give me noise, I will slowly decorrupt that piece of noise into something that looks like an image. Okay, so the forward process is a corruption process, it adds more noise slowly, and the reverse process, the thing we're going to try to learn, does the reverse of that, it tries to decorrupt or denoise the, in the image. Right, or whatever other modality you're looking at. This afternoon, you're gonna look at molecules, so uh, that's also fun, yeah? Now, so this is sort of like a diffusion perspective, uh, because this, proce this, this process of adding noise is typically a diffusion process. There's other perspective on diffusion models. Um, you can also look at them from a, a latent variable point of view or with an elbow maximization, which is something we're going to do. Uh, but you can also look at them as a score matching uh, from a score matching perspective, and that's the last part of this lecture where we'll quickly go over that. So there's, there's quite a lot of things to unpack here. All right. Now we'll go, when we want to derive diffusion models, we'll go on the, along the latent variable uh, road. Um, and so, qu quick recap, we've done this in the first part of this lecture already, but I'm gonna do it anyway. What we're going to try to do is model, take a latent variable model, um, where just for this slide, I'll recap a single latent variable. We're going to go to multiple. So we're going to say that our model distribution, right, is actually given by the marginalization of a joint distribution of observed data X and the latent variable Z, right? All of the VEE stuff we've done this morning is this. Okay, now the goal that we have is to optimize this model distribution to be close to the data distribution that we don't know. And from here on, the unknown data distribution is going to have the symbol Q of X. Please don't confuse this with the encoding distribution. Uh, 
<laughs> I know, this gets annoying, but just remember, from now on, Q of X is the data distribution that we don't know. Yeah? Now, we want to essentially maximize uh, or minimize the, uh, the KL. This is great, this should be minimized. Um, such that our model distribution, P of theta, given by this latent variable model, is close to the ground truth data. And this is essentially, this is exactly the same as a maximum likelihood objective, right? If I would evaluate this, I would draw samples from my data distribution, which are just my data training data points, right? And I would evaluate the sum over this, the, the log of P of theta x. Okay, now that's, that's the first goal we wanna have, right? That would allow us to train our generative model, but we also wanna draw samples from it, right? So somehow from this latent variable model, we wanna be able to draw samples. And if we define this joint distribution of P of X comma Z, if we factorize it in such a way that we first take P of Z and then X condition on Z, we can sample from this model very simple, right? If we first sample Z from P of Z, which should be a simple distribution, and then we evaluate the other P of X comma Z, we, we sample from that, and then we've sampled X. Yeah, so uh, small recap on latent variable models. Now, diffusion models introduce a lot of latent variables, T to be precise. We'll use the, here we'll use a capital letter T. And now we're going to try to see how again we're going to find a way to optimize the log likelihood, okay? So here I've already written on the left-hand side the log of P of theta of X, okay? Now, this is a latent variable model with T latent variables, okay? So this is a joint distribution of X and all of the random variables. Now, just as before with the VAE, if I want to maximize this, right, that integral is horrendous. And I don't want to do numerical integration based on MCMC inside a logarithm. Because as we discussed before, that gives me a biased estimate. Yeah? So I'm going to do exactly the same trick as I did with the VAE. I'm going to derive a lower bound, right? Now, we didn't really derive it for a VAE. We'll just slowly derive it here because it's fun. Okay. <coughs> And the way to derive it is as follows. You introduce a new distribution, Q of all of these Z's conditioned on X, and I multiply and divide, right? Right now I haven't done anything because I've essentially multiplied by one, right? Okay. Now, if I want to rewrite this, what I've essentially done is I said that the log likelihood is equal to the log and then expectation with respect to Q, that's this one, times P over the Q that we divided with, right? So this term is exactly, this equation is exactly the same as the one above. And now what we can do is use Jensen's inequality, which says that if you have an expectation inside of a function, depending on if that function is concave or uh, 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 convex, then the sign flips, you get an inequality. So you're allowed to pull the expectation through a concave or convex function, what you end up with then is, a, is, a, is, a, is an inequality instead of equality, okay? So Jensen's inequality says that I'm allowed to swap this logarithm and expectation at the cost of now having an inequality, okay? So what I end up with is, again, a lower bound to the log likelihood because I've introduced this new distribution, et cetera. Yeah. Now, a diffusion model will take a particular choice in how to choose how to choose the factorization of P and Q. And that's what we're going to go through next. Questions so far? Yeah. And this Q here is not the same as the Q we're trying to No. No. So the Q we're trying to approximate the data distribution is the unconditional QX. Yeah, that's, but that's a very good point. It's not the same. Any other question? Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. We start with that one. Yep. And you're asking why is that the same as log likelihood? Yeah. Okay. So forward KL is equal to. Uh, Well, because we, this is essentially equal to log likelihoods, right? So 
we're starting with, if you would do the other, okay, let me write down the expression, then I can answer it. So this would be, if I write it down in closed form. Oh, sorry. I always do this. Equal to this, yeah? Now, if I would do the reverse, right? I would first have to draw a sample from P of theta, not from my true distribution, right? And um, what else? Would there be pro another problem? No. But we want to evaluate this on samples from the, from the, from the ground truth model, right? We're getting, mod we're getting samples from Q of X already. So we'll, we'll choose this, and this will be up to a constant, right? This will be equal to optimizing the maximum likelihood. All right. Yep. Good. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is we have this lower bound, but there's still these really ugly beasts of uh, uh, P of theta and Q, right? Now we're going to look at the choice of how to factorize P and Q. Okay. So, just to repeat, Q is associated with the forward process that goes in the direction from data to noise. And P goes in the other direction. Oh. Right, amazing handwriting. Okay. Now what we're going to do for the forward process is we're going to define a Markov chain to infer the latents given the data. Now, what does that mean? That means that this Q, I'm going to factorize it as follows, right? So the joint Q, right, between the data and all the sets is just Q of X, this unknown data distribution. Oh, yeah? Sorry, I was asking, that, that, while you were saying it's very interesting, did you say Q is the distribution of data and noise, and P is the noise to data? Just what I'm talking Yes, okay. yes, Q goes here, yeah. P, we will associate in that direction. But we, we, we will, with the definition we're going to see right now, we're going to see that that makes sense. Okay, so the joint distribution of the forward process, right, takes the unknown data distribution Q of X, and then the conditional that we just introduced, right, of all of the latents given X. And we're going to factorize that term into a product of terms where you only depend on the previous latent variable, right? So we're going to say Z1, which is the first latent variable. So I take X here at the top. If I want to know the distribution of Z1 given X, it's just one conditional, right? Now, if I want to know the distribution of Z2 given Z1 and X, I'm going to say it will not depend on X. It only depends on Z1, right? So it forgot all of its history. All of the information for that distribution is contained in Z1. And so that, you kind of repeat that through the entire chain. You essentially say the conditional of ZT only depends on ZT minus one and not ZT minus two, right? And that's the Markov property here. Okay. So, uh, and we're gonna do essentially the same for the other process in the other direction, but as I said, in the other direction. So for this process, for the process where we go from noise to data in the bottom, we're going to say we're only going to define PZ T minus one given Z T, right? No Z T plus one, etc. Right? So the joint distribution is just a product of all of these two terms. Yeah? Questions on that? Mm, no? Now, I've copied over the definitions here of, that, of those factorizations, and we're gonna plug it back in to that expression of the uh, lower bound, which was this, right? So we had this expression for the lower bound of the, uh, 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 okay, the negative lower bound of the negative log likelihood, and now we're gonna plug this and that into here and here, and see what happens. And this will get us to something that resembles the objective we're looking for, but not exactly. Okay. So, I've just plugged it in here, 
right? So I've literally just inserted the above equations. So you have inside the logarithm at the numerator, we have these product, right? We have this term, that one, and then a product over uh, terms that go from T is two to capital T. And the same for the denominator. With the important thing here to note that this P always goes, defines T minus one, given ZT, right? where the Q always defines the distribution over ZT given ZT minus one. So it's the inverse direction, right? All right. Now what we can do, because the logarithm of a lot of products is the sum of a lot of logarithms, right? We can try to start combining different terms together and rewrite this whole thing. Now if we do that, we get something like this, right? So we take this term, right? That will be this. Now we take all of the products and we turn them into sums of logarithms, right? These t, these, these two to capital T terms, right? And we put them all together. And you get the sum over logarithms of this ratio plus this final term where you've essentially only left this one isolated. Yeah? Can you all see that? Anybody not seeing it? Q of X is. So we're defined. So right now we're we are going to make a choice of what Q of Z looks like, okay. and we're going to depending on that choice that we're going to make in in a second, we're going to say we'll we'll fix Q of Z given X. Nothing learned. Mm -hmm. We're just going to make a choice for that so that it slowly corrupts the data, mm. and then we're going to make learn P in the other direction. Okay. Yeah. So Q of X is unknown, and we'll make a predefined choice for all the conditionals of Q. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay, now let's have a look at that term again. I copied it, the, the last equation is the same one as I copied here at the top of the slide. Now this looks a little bit like KL divergences, right? But it's not really. This is like a sum of KL divergences, but not really. Can someone tell me why it's not a KL divergence? Yeah. It's not what? Yeah. yeah. So so the, so the the answer indeed is that. If you take a KL divergence, right, you have to integrate over one random variable or, you know, over a set of random variables, but it always has to be the same, the top and the bottom, right? But here, the top distribution is over ZT minus one and the bottom is over ZT, right? So this is not really a KL divergence. I, I don't know how to make one out of this. So either we pick a different regrouping or we have to flip the direction of one of these distributions. Now, the regrouping doesn't really work, so we'll have to flip it. Um, so we're going to try to look at the posterior of the forward distribution, right? So the forward distribution goes from ZT minus one to ZT. If I make a posterior, right, it goes from ZT minus one to ZT, right? But that's not necessarily Markov, so we probably have to do something to it. Now what we're gonna do is make use of this Markov property in a bit of a nasty way. We're gonna say, um, well, actually, I think I messed it up. Let me check. <laughs> this would be funny. Uh, yeah, I did mess it up. That's great. I oh, know I didn't. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm confusing myself. Okay, so this is the forward distribution, right? So we're increasing time steps. Okay, now I'm allowed to put x the data point in here. It doesn't depend on this, it's Markov, right? But I can put it in there, it doesn't matter, right? Now I'm going to use Bayes' rule and flip the order of ZT and ZT minus one, but I'll keep X there, okay? So I can flip the order of ZT, ZT minus one, then I get this, right? I'll leave X there. Then in order to do Bayes' rule correctly, I have to multiply that with ZT given X, right? and this normalization constant. 
Now, I can insert that, this equation, into all the places in the above equation where here this term appears. Right? And this will allow me to flip the order of zt minus 1 and zt, right? Okay, I'll do that. This gets super nasty. I'm not going to go over this right now. But what you end up with is actually ratios of terms that do go over the same random variable, plus a few other terms, and then you reorder them, and then you get something like this. So now we have a, a, a negative lower bound, or say an upper bound <laughs> to the negative log likelihood, which is consisting of this reconstruction term, which is actually exactly the same as what we had in the VE, right? Except for the fact that, by the way, I don't think I've mentioned this at all, that the Zs here take the same dimensionality as X, similar to a generative normalizing flow, but we leave out any of the invertibility constraints. Yeah? Okay? Now, this is a reconstruction term, and now we have, say, T minus 1 terms here that are all expectations over KL divergences, right? So here, in order to compute this, I would have to take X, my data point that someone gives me from the unknown distribution Q of X, and I compute the distribution of ZT, of the teeth, uh, okay, that sounds weird, of the T, I don't know how to say that, ZT, uh, given X, right? So I essentially take T diffusion steps, right? I compute that, I sample that, and then I compute this KL divergence between the posterior of the forward distribution and the, say, the, the term of the generative model that goes in the opposite direction that belongs to that time step T. Yeah? Uh, and then there's one more term that is a KL divergence for the last step in the process. Yeah? Now, this objective, compared to the one that we have at the top, if you look at it, it has, uh, if you can compute the KL divergence in closed form, right? It has, typically has lower variance than the top objective. Um, so it's a bit easier to optimize. And so this is the objective that is typically used for a diffusion model. Yeah? Questions? Yeah? If I made the assumption of Marco on the Q distribution, how it is characterized to the Q distribution of Z and T given X? Uh, oh, well, so Q of ZT given X, right, you can just get that by sampling, okay, you can say Q of ZT given X, right, you can get that by marginalizing out all the other random variables that lie in between, right? So I can say this is the same as DZ1 to ZT minus 1, Q of ZT I'm going to run out of space. Z1, X, right? And now here I can include, I, can, I, I, could, I could insert this Markov property, right? And it would all still be consistent. Right? Now, the nice thing is for some distributions, if I want to sample ZT given X, and there's like T steps in between, for a generic distribution, I would have to do T steps of sampling, right? But for some distributions, like our beloved Gaussian distributions, I can compute that T-step density in a closed form. So I won't be dependent on, I won't necessarily have to draw T samples to get the teeth, to get ZT. Yeah? But we'll get to that in point. Yeah? So this is like a normalizing flow, but with the stochastic transformations. I don't ever do. That's a good question. I, I think, um, Okay, but if a normalizing flow is stochastic, then uh, calling it a normalizing flow becomes a bit more complicated again, right? So I think you can see it like that. So maybe the other way of viewing it that I find more helpful maybe. is to say it's a VAE, mm. but with the same size of latent variables, uh, with a whole stack of latent variables. Yeah. It's of the same size as the input, but you make it so deep that at some point you lose all information, and with a fixed encoder. I find that comparison easier than the normalizing flow one. Now, normalizing flow you could do too, but then I think you can, it will become a normalizing flow with auxiliary random variables. Mm 
So the, the noise you inject corresponds to auxiliary random variables. And that's not something we've discussed, so that becomes a bit hard. Yeah, what if you just said, yeah, I mean, your, essentially your Q is just delta distribution. Delta. It's just what? A delta distribution. Delta. Oh, yeah, but, but here it's not, right? Here it's not. Yeah. But in normalized flow. If it would be, yeah. if Q would be a delta distribution, but then we don't get, then you're not corrupting, right? Corruption yeah. has this property that you're losing information, right? And a normalizing flow, because it's invertible, per definition doesn't really corrupt, right? You're not losing any information. You're kind of rewriting, maybe, in a normalizing flow. But where then information is, like all the information is then in parameters, theta, so then we can... In a normalizing flow or in a... Uh, well, the information, if, if, you, if, if I apply diffusion up to T layers, and T is very large, mm -hmm. I will lose all information on my image. Yeah? But when you restore? Uh, well, the, 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 um, the restoring process isn't really, I would, it's not really a restoring. It's like, unless, you, okay. Let's say that I would have taken an image and I would have corrupted it up to halfway in the diffusion process. If I restore that, I have a whole distribution of images that I still get, but that contain some information of the original image, but could be new reconstructions, right? In that sense, it's similar again to a VAE, right? So if you take a VAE, I take an image, and I push it through my latent code, right? That code doesn't contain all the information of the original image, right? So if I reconstruct it, I'm probably going to reconstruct something that looks similar to the original image, but it's not exactly the original image, right? Okay. Right. Uh, when you said it looks similar, it looks similar to a machine or it looks similar to a human? Well, that's a very good question. Um, it looks similar according to the distributions <laughs> and the KL diversions. <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, metrics that people devise on determining whether or not images, image distributions from a model and the real data look similar, right? We have uh, 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 inception scores, etc. It's a bit of a, a dark art, I would say. Um, and yeah, here I would say probabilistically it looks similar. What is the general order of the value of t? Oh, that's okay. The question is, what's the general order of the value of the value of t? Okay, very much depends. I think the paper by Jonathan Ho had a thousand, if I remember correctly, and then people started increasing it so that you know you get even better models. But then the problem is, if you want to sample from that model, you have to sample a thousand times, right? So there's also a lot of work that goes towards saying, okay, how do I design a a diffusion model that is still diffusion model ish like which has much less steps so it depends a little bit on yeah it could be in the thousands i think i've also seen diffusion models that have five steps but then it's i is it really a diffusion model i don't know but yeah for like imogen or uh, oof imogen i don't know we would have to check um Uh, okay, so the question is, do we have reversible steps, essentially, right? And with reversible, do you mean invertible? Uh, yes. Yeah, no. So, and what if uh, they are? Um, okay, then we go to something that, I, if, so, if they are invertible, we go to something that your uh, fellow student, uh, uh, then you get something that looks like a normalizing flow, but with additional auxiliary random variables. Should we what? No, but it's easier. I think so. I guess so. We don't have to make it non-invertible, but I guess the point here is that you don't have to make it invertible because making it invertible is a bit of a pain, right? And here we're saying you don't have to do it, right? And even if you would, I don't think you would gain much here in the end because then you then you're left with a normalizing flow with an auxiliary random variable, but it's still not an exact likelihood model. So I don't know if that's super useful. Yeah. That question, uh, don't you think that like in normalizing flow, you essentially, if you choose the base distribution as the standard, nor like diagonal normal mm -hmm. square distribution, it's essentially also like a white noise. So yeah. you all you use just in, how to say, 
Mm -hmm. And then you have some like data point, like image, and then you map it to basically noise, right? Yes, but the mapping is deterministic. So, yeah, so if I give you one, the information is not lost, right? It's the same distribution that's true, right? They're both, they both, if, if, and we haven't even done it yet, but if we're starting to make all of these Qs and Ps Gaussian, we're going to go also to a standard normal distribution. Mm -hmm. But um, the mutual information between, if I diffuse towards the sample in, the, in, uh, in diffusion, right, to the standard normal sample, I've really lost all information. Yeah, okay. I can't recover what the original X was. With the normalize, normalizing flows, I know which one it is. Now there are I have to say that you know there are versions of diffusion models where you can come up with a uh, 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 probability flow that is connected to this and it gets very complicated and then you can come up with a uh, an invertible sample but that's I think a bit beyond the scope of this uh, okay. thing. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for this guy. When you use the base formula, you just introduce the x. Sure, we can do it. Um, but then it also appears in the KL and there. And the why does it make a difference for the KL if I condition on something? Uh, not for the KL, but uh, so in, in, in fact, if we then want the distribution Q of set T minus one to set T, mm -hmm. do we really condition in our flow then also on X? And yep, that X stays there. But it's not up in the. It's not there now. No, that's true. Why doesn't it make? I, I'm confused. Why can't we just use it? Uh, why can't we just use it? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I guess my counter question would be why not. But <laughs> uh, it's it's literally just a rewriting trick, right? So that we get something that is actually KL divergence over the same random variable. You know, KL divergence between distributions over the same random variable. Maybe we can talk about it then after. Okay. All right. Let's try to move on a little bit. Yeah. Okay. It's like a, it's you can use it as a generative model, right? As like any other generative model, the application is you know generative modeling, which is not necessarily an application by itself, but you can use it, for instance, to do what uh, Imogen and Dali did, right? Where you produce new images or produce videos or given a text you can produce new uh, uh, images. So any, say, downstream application that has a generative component you can use a, a diffusion model for. Does that make sense? Well, but so the, what you will use in the downstream information is a, a downstream application is not the corruption process, right? You will probably only use the uh, uh, if you just use it as a pure generative model, you will only use the direction that goes from noise to data. All right? If, if, your, if your application requires you to generate new data points that look like your original data, I don't need the forward process anymore. Yeah? All right. Let's try to move on. Okay. Now, we've, this is the objective of the uh, diffusion model. Um, and there's a few interesting properties that I'm going to name now, and then we can uh, see um, how that works if we make an actual choice for what Q and P looks like. Now, already a long time ago, people realized that if you make a particular choice for Q, let's say Q is Gaussian, or Q is, uh, I don't know, binomial distribution, that the optimal reverse process, so the optimal P, has the same functional form, <clears throat> which means that if Q is Gaussian, then the optimal P is also Gaussian. Or if Q is binomial, then the optimal P will also be binomial. Right? And this, is, this is, will help us to choose the functional form for P if we fix the choice for Q. Uh, and now the other thing is, is that because we're going to apply many, many, many noise corruption uh, uh, steps, if we do this for a long time, for many choices of Q, what we're going to end up with is a stationary distribution, which means nothing else than saying that if I take, if I compute this marginal of ZT given X for a very large T, this will become independent of X, right? And that 
is also kind of what it means for it to lose all information, right? So we'll end up with a distribution that is only dependent on Z, right? No information on X anymore. All right. Okay, so practically, right? We've looked a lot at the theory, but now we have to start making a choice of what we actually fix Q to and what we're going to use to uh, fix the reverse direction, P. Now, practical requirements are as follows, right? If you look at this objective, we have this sum over terms of T is 2 to capital T and this expectation with respect to Z T given X. Now, one of you asked a smart question, like, I mean, how does that work, right? <clears throat> I thought there were a lot, of, a lot of them in between, right? It's true. But for some distributions, right, if you can sample Z T in one go from X, this will save you a lot of time, right? Because if I do that, I can essentially just draw, when I, when I optimize this objective, I can randomly draw a time step t from the uniform distribution and just in one go sample z t, and that makes the evaluation of this loss much quicker, right? Okay, so preferably, we pick a q or functional form for q such that we can efficiently sample, oh, this shouldn't be z x t, this should be z t, z t given x at training time. Now, the other thing we'd like to do is for there to be a tractable expression for this posterior of the forward process, right? Uh, this is, so you can't go completely wild on whatever you pick on Q because this has to be tractable, right? Otherwise, we can't evaluate this loss anymore. And now, what's even nicer is if we can compute the KL in closed form, but we don't necessarily have to do that. Is it also that? Is it? Oh, yes, sorry. I, this is all slide uh, me duplicating the information. Let's do this. Sorry. Yeah, good point. Uh, other questions? No? Okay, now the nice thing is that these requirements, practical requirements, are satisfied if we pick Q and, well, and therefore also P, uh, to be either Gaussian or binomial. Right? We all love Gaussian distributions because they, they marginalize very easily, right? And posteriors are easy. As long as we don't do any nonlinearities in there, it's all good, right? That's why I guess we love them. Okay. Now, let's actually have a look at that, right? So let's make the choice that the conditional for the forward distribution, Q, where we get ZT given ZT minus 1, is equal to this Gaussian with mean given by a scalar multiplication of square root of beta t, where beta t is some hyperparameter, times the previous uh, random variable, z t minus 1, and with a variance equal to this. So again, this beta t is just a hyperparameter, and each time step t will have its own noise parameter, uh, beta. Right? Um, now, the first practical requirement was that sampling at arbitrary time steps in one shot would be good, right? So ideally, I can do this um, z1 to zt minus 1 of qz1 all the way up to zt of x in closed form. Right? That would be easy. Now we can with a Gaussian because Gaussians are great. Um, and this actually just evaluates to this distribution. It's also still a Gaussian, but it just has a different mean and a different variance, right? Where the mean and the variance depend on the betas that we chose before in this way. All right, okay, so first requirement satisfied. The second is that we wanted the tractable expression for the posterior, right? So we have to be able to evaluate that. And again, this is just a normal distribution with a bit of a nasty mean, but it, you know, we do know this expression this mean mu tilde and, uh, you know, a bit of a nasty variance. But again, all depends on the previous uh, hyperparameters and variables. Yeah? So, practically, this makes it very easy to train this diffusion process with Gaussian choices. Okay, so the question is why we only have one beta t, why we don't make it more complicated, I guess? Yeah, like, Oof, uh, that's a good point. I think if you, uh, if you make them independent, 
I think this is done such that your stationary distribution, if you add more and more and more noise, you're going to converge to the standard normal. I think if you make them independent, that might not be no longer true, but I'm looking at Jinwei, who might not also know. <laughs> we have to have a look. I think this definitely guarantees that that happens. If you make them independent, I think you have to be a bit careful. Um, okay, yeah? I still cannot believe that it's true for uh, like all the distributions so that you have the same say, family for both uh, mm -hmm. and backwards. Yeah. Or do, do you need some kind of complicated priors? No, I don't think so. So, so the question is, is isn't this um, property that the functional form of the forward process is the same as the backward property? Yeah, yeah. Does that rely, rely on any conjugate priors? I don't think so. Yeah. So I don't think so, but I haven't looked super deep into this, but yeah, I would say with 80% uh, uh, certainty, I would say it's not related to that, but it is related to that? It's not related. It isn't. Okay, good. Jenny also confirms. Good. Well, let's increase uncertainty up to 90%. Um, it's not related to that. Okay. Um, okay. So now we've seen that for Gaussians, right? This is all great. At least the practical requirements work out. So we can train with this super effectively, right? So just to make sure, if I would pick any other, say, distribution for, or not any other, most other distributions for continuous random variables, if Q of, if this one is of whatever form, the posterior doesn't have to be of the same form, right? It can be a completely different distribution, right? Like conjugate priors where it's not the same. Okay, now, recap. We had these interesting processes, uh, inter interesting properties, right, that said that the forward process and the, sec and the backward process have the same functional form. So if we picked Q to be Gaussian, I will then also make the choice that P will be Gaussian. I will have to learn its mean and variance, but we're going to say it is Gaussian. Now we're going to make the additional restrictive assumption that we're not going to learn variance and it's going to have diagonal covariance. There, is, there are papers around there that have non-diagonal covariance and that learn them. I'm not entirely sure if it's really needed, but there are approaches that look into this. For now, we're going to say the reverse direction is also Gaussian because of this property. And even though we're not at T's infinity, we're going to say it's probably still true. Okay, so we have to somehow parameterize the mean. And now, um, it also turns out to be the case, as I said before, that if we pick these beta parameters to be such that they're quite relatively small, right, and they increase in size, that what we're going to end up with at large t, that this is close to the standard normal distribution, right? So there will be no dependence on x anymore, right? So that means that this final, right, for, for the reverse process, okay, where was I? Slight disruption. So we had to pick P of ZT minus 1 comma ZT, right? Or given on ZT, right? That's over here. We had to make a choice for this one. But there was also this unconditional P of ZT, the final ZT, right? We had to make a choice. Now, if you look at this objective, right? The only term at which this comes into the objective is in the KL diversion between Q of ZT and X, right? Now, that one, if we make t large enough, we've just seen that goes to standard normal. So if we're smart, we pick p of zt also just the standard normal. So that this term actually just, you know, it, it just goes away. It's almost zero. Yeah? Okay. Okay, now for the last part, we're going to think about smart choices for parameterizing the mean of the reverse process because it turned out that when uh, the paper of Jonathan Ho and his colleagues came out, this wasn't, definitely wasn't the first paper on diffusion models, right? Yasha schultz dixstein and, and his colleagues had introduced diffusion models, I think, several years before that already. Um, and interestingly, if you look at citation count for that paper, it was flat and then pff, exploded when, uh, when Jonathan Ho essentially said, okay, we can do all of that, but we have to be a bit smarter in our parameterization of the mean. Okay? And, okay, and a few other tweaks, but this one was quite crucial. Okay, so let's look at the terms in the uh, uh, loss that are all the, KL, all the KL divergences, yeah? So for each T, we have 
its own chaotic divergence. Now, if we made, made these Gaussian choices, right? So we had a Gaussian for P of theta with this parameterizable mean, right? So that's over here. And we had this very, okay, not super nasty, but we had a little bit of a nasty posterior, which was still Gaussian, right? Now, the KL version between two Gaussians is known in closed form. Now, in this case, the standard deviations are fixed. We're not learning them, so we can kind of leave them out. If you just use that form for the KL divergence, we get something that looks like this, right? So this is a mean squared error between the mean, this one, this is the mean of the posterior of this one, mu tilde. Had a bit of an ugly expression, we'll get to that in a second. And the mean of the learnable P, plus some constants that is probably ratios between standard deviations, but since they're not learned anyway, we can kind of leave them out. Yeah? Okay. Now, the simplest solution, let me get this way, is to say, okay, we're just going to parameterize mu of theta directly with a neural network. So that neural network takes its input, zt, and spits out mu. And that mu better be close to the uh, mean of the posterior. That's possible. Now, what Jonathan Ho and his colleagues did is something different. They looked at the functional form of the mean of the posterior. And they said, actually, we can rewrite it compared to how we wrote it before and say this is actually equal to this expression where we have zt, right? But we also have this noise variable which was related to how we sampled zt from x, right? So originally, mu tilde, the mean of the posterior of the forward process, you know, it takes as input zt and x. Now, if I rewrite x and zt and relate them through this standard normal noise that we inserted, because everything is normal, right? Reparameterization trick all over again, right? I can rewrite the mean into this form. So we know that the correct mean has this form, where epsilon here is the noise that we added roughly to x to produce zt. Okay. Now, if we know that, we can say, okay, but does it then really make sense to just predict this whole quantity, or shall I say, I will predict this quantity minus this term already? Right? That doesn't make... I mean, you already kind of know something about the functional form. Why not use it? Right? So what we can then say is we're going to say that the mean of the, pre, of the um, uh, reverse process, we're going to say it kind of looks similar. So we're again going to... Because it takes that t as an input, right? We're going to use exactly the same term here and then the same prefactor here for that noise, and we're going to have a neural network that doesn't take x and zt as an input, but just zt and t. So essentially, that neural network has to learn what the noise was that was used to produce zt from x. Okay? Now, if we do that, if we just plug in these two equations in the top equation, then we get something like this. We literally get a mean squared error between the noise that you used to produce zt, this is zt, And we're going to put that into the network, add the original image to it, so you can't actually distinguish between the two anymore. And now I have a neural network that, you know, that tries to recover that noise. Now, it turns out that that is, learns much better than the naive estimate of just directly predicting the mean. Oh, okay. Now, there is one prefactor here, lambda t, which is a bit nasty, and um, if you plot the log, if you plot these terms as a function of t, you get very, you get a big difference in terms of magnitude as a function of t. So what you can also do is just naively say, okay, pff, I don't care about the prefactor, I'm just going to set it to one for everything, and then all of the last terms have the same size, roughly. Now this was called the L simple loss in uh, Johnson Ho's paper, and it also turns out to work much better. So you're now actually not really doing a uh, variational lower bound anymore. But it does work really well. <laughs> and it turns out that if you do this, this is actually very similar to score matching. Um, now, just to recap, what we do at training time is that you take your data from the unknown data distribution, Q of X. Can you read this? Yeah. I uniformly sample T to evaluate one of the loss terms. And then I take 
I sample a noise term, epsilon, right? That I use to produce zt, right? Through this equation. I feed that into my noise network, nt. And I essentially uh, optimize the mean squared, mean squared error between the output of that neural network and the original noise. Super simple mean squared error loss. And works really well. Now at test time, what you do is you just do the exact same thing, but you sample zt from, because they're all Gaussian distributions, right? You just recompute the mean every time for, all, for the entire sequence, right? Start at zt, which is standard normal. Uh, then compute the mean of the next conditional distribution, given that form that we just discussed in the previous slide, and you just sample consecutively with these steps. Yeah? Yeah. So you force somehow that your Z with FLT is normal during training? Uh, you don't even enforce that during training. You've enforced that even before training, right? Because we've said, because of the choices we've made for all the queues, we know that the sta stationary distribution is standard normal. So you have to like, choose capital T sufficiently? Yes, you have to pick capital T sufficiently large. Or, or adjust your parameters beta uh, to that. Either one of the two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, I think in two minutes, some alarm goes off. So um, well, these are the results. They're great. Okay. Super nice images. Yeah? But then it's, this sampling is like as it's like you don't really know the true uh, Z, like, say, stationary distribution. Uh, I mean, you know the stationary, but you don't, how to say, send to infinity. Yeah, you, you, but you can evaluate the KLD version. So you, can, you know up to what degree that's true or not. But we can maybe talk about that afterwards. Okay. Now, I think it's not worth going into the score matching perspective. I will leave that into the slides in case you're interested in it. Turns out that the diffusion model is essentially a score matching model where instead of modeling directly the, lo the, 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 the likelihood of the model, where you would model the gradient of the log of P of X. If you do that, which is a completely different approach, um, uh, Yang Sung and his great colleagues show that this is essentially the same as diffusion models, and you can draw some really nice parallels there. Now, we don't have time to do that, and I think in one minute some alarm goes off, so let's not do that. Um, so I think that was it for today. So this afternoon, Jinwei and Victor will uh, uh, go with you guys through a hands-on tutorial on making diffusion models for molecule generation. Yeah? Okay, that's it.